Thinking Aloud, conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with parapsychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello, I'm Jeffrey Mishlove, and today I'm going to talk about phantasms, tulpas, and egregores. And let me state right at the outset that my interest in these subjects is primarily scientific in, in the sense that I think these concepts have incredible implications for the social and behavioral sciences. Now, the concepts themselves seem to come out of esoteric culture. They seem to be related to the arts of magic, but Surely, the arts of magic have enormous implications for science in general and have been studiously ignored by science in general. But I think that's changing now, as I've mentioned several times before since the August 2018 article in the American Psychologist. It seems to me behavioral scientists now have an obligation to take the data of parapsychology seriously. And we can begin with the classic text, Phantasms of the Living, authored by yeah, Edmund Gurney, Frederick Myers, I think Podmore was the third author. Phantasms of the Living was a study published toward the end of the 19th century in which uh, which was based on the, um, how can I put it, case studies of individuals who reported apparitions. And these apparitions, it turned out, were based on living people, apparitions of living people, not apparitions of the deceased, as one might well imagine. There were plenty of apparitions of the deceased as well. And those are very important for our study of the possibility of human survival. But that whole study became, in effect, contaminated by the possibility that apparitions can be produced by the living. And they might be apparitions of living people, but if a living person can produce an apparition of themselves, why can't they produce an apparition that resembles something that is not themselves? Then what is an apparition in any case? The picture gets even more complicated by the study that was done in the 1970s uh, at the Toronto Society for Psychical Research, the classic study of Philip the Ghost. And I've talked about that in a previous In Presence monologue, as I recall. I can link to it right now. Uh, but there's a lot of data about this. Uh, when people get together uh, in a Victorian-style seance, set, sit around a table and sing songs and enter into a uh, state of group rapport where they have a, a common story that they share, in this case, a fictitious story about a ghost named Philip. Well, what they began producing were paranormal table wraps, one wrap for yes, two wraps for no or vice versa, I'm not even sure which, but the important point here is that acoustical studies were done on these wraps. They're not the kind of wraps that you could produce by knocking on a wooden table. They had a different acoustical signature. They were indeed paranormal wraps, and they were responding to questions being posed by the sitters at the seance. And the responses, interestingly enough, were produced in accordance with the fictitious story about a medieval ghost named Philip who died tragically in a sort of a gothic tale, romantic circumstances. Uh, but it was a tale. It was a fiction. And yet, it produced paranormal effects. This is becoming quite interesting because it also is consistent with the notion of the tulpa. Now, I first heard about tulpas long ago because um, there's a classic book written by uh, Alexandra David Neal, who was a woman, as I recall, early in the 20th century, around the 1920s or so, at a time when Tibet was pretty much closed 
to foreigners, she managed to travel to Tibet. She became acquainted with Tibetan monks. You can see her in her Tibetan garb, and she reports the creation of a tulpa. This is something understood in Tibetan Mahayana Buddhism as an emanation of the mind itself. And she began concentrating on, on the idea that there was this person, and the person began to take on a form. She could see the person. Other people could see the person. Well, she knew it was a creation of her own concentration. However, it began to take on a life of its own, and uh, it got to become an annoyance. It was insulting people. It was harassing people. A tulpa, a fictitious figure that had taken on the cloak of materiality. Eventually, the other uh, Tibetans in her group had to banish it or exorcise it, which they understood how to do in their tradition. Today, we now know there are people who consider themselves tulpamancers. One of uh, our Thinking Aloud viewers describes himself as a Tulpa master. And um, if you look on uh, Wikipedia, you can see that amongst computer gamers, people who enter into fantasy worlds where psychic powers are real, there is a subculture of tulpamancers. People who, who create these fictitious characters and they take on a life of their own. They could be animals. They could be my little pony, I believe, is, is one of them. So, uh, Annie Besant, one of the you know, founders of the Theosophical Movement or the early pioneers, it was founded by others, Madame Blavatsky and Colonel Alcott, but Annie Besant came shortly thereafter and, and she acknowledged that these tulpas can take on different forms. They can be the form of the person creating them. They can be a form of uh, something that that person imagines, but they can even go a little deeper. They can take on a, a thought form, something uh, not uh, a personality, not a person, not an entity, but an idea. That brings us to the next level, egregores. What is an egregore? And uh, here, I think, uh, we get back to the behavioral sciences, to sociology. Emile Durkheim, the great French researcher who was one of the founders of the whole field of sociology, had this notion that the deities of any particular culture, Jesus Christ, for example, is a projection of the group mind of that culture. Now, it, of course, this came in the 19th century, a period of, of the height of materialistic thinking. And uh, I think people didn't take Durkheim literally. They thought of the group mind as a, a, as a kind of symbolic thing. But if we look at the research now on uh, phantasms, and uh, Philip the Ghost, who is a for, uh, in effect a tulpa, if we begin to take parapsychology seriously, we have to look at the group mind in a new way. And the egregore, it's related, I think, to the word aggregation. The aggregation, when a collective of people hold a, a certain uh, thought form together, in their mind. Now, that thought form could be a deity. It could be Jesus Christ. It could be uh, a satanic figure, a demonic figure. It could be uh, Allah, or it could be Yahweh. It could be Prometheus, as my friend Jason, uh, I believe, uh, pictures it. These are you might say, products of the individual minds in the group, but then they begin to take on a life of their own, just like Alexandra David Neal's tulpa. And sometimes they get out of control. Perhaps they even need to be banished. Uh, we've done programs on the idea of rebellion against God. There can be a point at which the our own thoughts take on a life of their own and begin to dominate us. Though <laughs> recently released a an interview on conspiracy theories, and I hear from so many viewers who believe that these conspiracies are real, but imagine if the 
source of the conspiracy are your own thoughts. Consider that. And it may be a, a thought that we have collectively produced that takes on a life of its own, exists in what my friend Marty Rosenblatt calls the universe of collective consciousness. This just opens up a, a whole new vista for exploration. And I'm sure many behavioral scientists, if you're listening to my monologue, you're throwing up your hands and saying, how are we supposed to deal with this? It's too amorphous. It's too nebulous. It needs to be operationalized. Indeed, it does. But uh, parapsychology has decades of history in operationalizing these things. The uh, behavioral sciences in general, not to mention the biological sciences and the physical sciences, are all going through major crises. And maybe these crises are opportunities to begin to incorporate the empirical data of parapsychology into our new paradigms. I don't expect any of this to happen rapidly, maybe not for another 50 or 100 years, but I'm issuing the call now because this is what needs to take place. Now, for those of you listening, let me ask you the question, are there phantasms or tulpas or egregores operating in your life? Is it possible that some of your own thoughts have taken on a life of their own, manifesting not only in the, the tendencies of your own consciousness, but perhaps even independently in the world around you. Think about that. And thank you for being with me.